It's my great pleasure to introduce our main speaker this morning, the keynote speaker, Trevor Phillips, Mr. Trevor Phillips. <clears throat> Trevor Phillips is a writer and television producer. He is co-founder of Weber and Phillips Limited, a data, analytic, uh, data analytic provider. <clears throat> From 25th of March, 2015 for a term of three years, Trevor will serve as president of the Partnership Council of the John Lewis Partnership, the first external appointment since 1928. He is also currently deputy chair of the steering committee for the National Equality Standard and chair of the Green Park, Green Park Diversity Analytics. Now, he is the former <clears throat> chair of the Equality and Human Rights Commission and the Commission for Racial Equality. He is now elected chair of the Greater London Authority. His most recent work was a film, television film called Things We Won't Say About Race That Are True. Uh, which was produced in 2015, March 2015, on Channel 4, attracting some 2 million uh, viewers and extensive press, active, press coverage. <clears throat> Trevor is currently writing a prequel to his successful book, Wind Rush, which will appear soon. I have very great pleasure to invite him to g give us his keynote speech for this morning. Please. Well, thank you very much indeed for that kind introduction. Uh, you see, I'm, I'm fiddling here. I've discovered a new piece of technology, uh, and you're the first to be um, favoured by my reading a speech from my iPad. So if halfway through I just suddenly stop speaking, it's because I've lost my, I've lost my words. Anyway, um, as I am here, I, I would just like to start, though she isn't in the room, by congratulating both SOAS and the new director of the school on her appointment. Such a distinguished institution needs a great, le great leader and there are few who have Valerie Amos's mix of wisdom, experience, and steel, all of which are sorely needed in higher education today. I'm very grateful for the invitation uh, this morning. Um, I don't do this sort of thing too much these days. Much as I enjoyed being chair of the Equality and Human Rights Commission, there are many things in public life I was glad to leave behind. For example, constantly being confused with Trevor MacDonald, or, or David Lammy, or Howard from the Halifax. Um, or I'm thinking right now, being called every year round about this time as Christmas approaches to adjudicate on whether schools should and could celebrate Christmas and whether teachers could say it had something to do with the baby Jesus without offending Muslim parents. But it's a privilege to contribute to this discussion and the topic could hardly be more timely. I'm delighted that in spite of recent events, by the way, it is still possible to talk about a difficult topic like this one on a British campus without the, meet the meeting being disrupted or subject to a ban because someone has decided to be offended even before they've heard what anyone else has to say. Today, we're focusing on the word integration, but we're also, I think, talking about a deeper, more profound question that faces virtually every society in the world. In the 21st century, the human species will face two overarching questions. First, how do we live with our planet? A set of questions around climate change and so on. And second, how do we live with each other? I have no doubt that of the two dilemmas, the second is the less tractable and is also the more urgent. 
We've all seen graphically this summer what is happening at Europe's margins and in the Mediterranean. And these scenes represent just the start of an immense demographic change in our continent. One, by the way, that Africa has been facing for some time. The numbers we face are small by comparison with, say, those laid out to me by my Chinese equivalent at uh, the HRC some years back. I now gather that China is planning to move a quarter of a billion people from the land to the cities over the next decade, an unprecedented undertaking. The reasons for these great movements of people may be to encourage growth, to flee conflict or starvation, or simply the product of human restlessness. But whatever the cause, the demographic cha challenges ahead are enormous. The fact is that these changes are bringing more different kinds of people into close proximity or even conflict with more of others of a different background than at any point in human history. These migrations aren't just an economic and social issue, they bring religious and cultural dilemmas with them too. For example, today there are 44 million Muslims in Europe. By 2050, that number will be 71 million, some one in 10 of the continent's population. We will, if we're lucky enough still to be around, be living in a very different Europe. Here in the UK, the visible minority population will rise from its current 13% to, being, to between 25 and 35% by 2050. Some cities, Birmingham, Leicester, for example, will be over 50% non-white British. London already feels like a different country to, say, Northumbria, Northumbria or Kent or Norfolk. According to the leading demographer, Peter Rees of Leeds University, we can expect more than half of Britain's districts to become more like London and the other half to become very different. I'd like to say a few words about why this topic holds so much personal as well as a professional significance for me. I was born in London, but our family circumstances were such that my parents <coughs> thought it better to send me back to Guyana, the country that they still called home, as a baby. So like the school's new director, as a child and teenager, I was lucky in to enjoy the privilege of living in one of the most diverse countries in the world. I went to, people, to school with people as diverse as you could imagine, Europeans, Asians, Arabs, Africans, uh, Native Americans. On the other hand, there was no TV, no fancy restaurants that I knew about, just one major library in a city of 200,000 people. As in most Commonwealth nations, we had the experience of living within a cultural, ethnic, and racial mix probably not paralleled since the last days of the Roman Imperium. My old class list in Guyana show names like Ali, Ishmael, Persaud, Chan, Ming, Tenpao, and Singh, as well as the conventional European names given to the descendants of slaves, Adams, Harris, Allen, Moore, and Phillips. But as in so much of the Commonwealth, behind the racial and religious rainbow, there lay a bitter and often violent history of ethnic feuding, which still disfigures that small country. One of my own classmates and friends, a man called Donald Rodney, in later years saw his brother, the writer and academic Walter Rodney, murdered largely for espousing the cause of non-racial politics. Today, Guyana remains one of the poorest nations in the world, fatally stricken by racial and ethnic divisions, unable to realize its natural resources. So I've seen and lived firsthand with the tantalizing possibilities of great diversity and the ghastly consequences of the absence of a generous toleration. That period taught me several things about integration. First, that integration isn't an automatic human response to diversity. It's a learned behavior. And that learning is inherited or not. I also grew to understand that integration is a two-way street. The absence of integration isn't always just down to the absence of opportunity. It sometimes is. When my parents came here, some people really would move out of the street when they moved in. But that wasn't always the case. The traffic on this highway runs in both directions. The absence of integration almost always involves a mix of motivations 
and some element of unconstrained choice also features. Whilst we'd like to pretend this isn't true, it's hard to explain why, for example, East African Asian millionaires who could afford to buy homes in any part of the capital choose to congregate in the perfectly pleasant but undistinguished suburbs of northwest London. Or why schools in England and Wales are more segregated than they need to be, a topic I'll address in a moment. Third, growing up in Guyana, I learned that the absence of integration can lead people to believe that outcomes which are, in fact, entirely unrelated to their race are down to the colour of their skins. Anyone who's read Rob Ford and Matthew Goodwin's stellar book on the UKIP tribe will know that most UKIP voters don't start out believing that they are left behind because of their colour. They know that they're losing out because of globalisation, because of their lack of education, because of their age. But as they coalesced into a single grouping, the identity that came most naturally was a visible characteristic that most of them shared, being white. Over time, for many UKIPers, this factor has actually eclipsed the original cause of their disquiet. The emergence of this white tribe isn't a British peculiarity. We only have to look across the channel, where almost one in three French people support a party, the Front National, which is arguably anti-immigrant and is certainly by its own declaration anti-Islamic. Its new leader, Marine Le Pen, currently leads the polls in voting intention for the presidential election of 2017. In Austria, where a similar party is polling above a fifth of the popular vote, in Sweden, liberal, civilised Sweden, the largest party in Parliament, Sweden Democrats, described by the Daily Telegraph as an anti-immigration party with roots in the neo-Nazi movement, polling above 25%. There are similar stories in Denmark, Finland and in Holland. And in Greece, where the anti-immigrant Golden Dawn took 7% of the poll in last month's general election. And if you want to know what they stand for, listen to what one of their MPs, Ilias Panagiotaris, said before they became popular. This is before they became popular. Uh, and I'm quoting the Daily Mail here. If Golden Dawn gets into Parliament, he said, it will carry out raids on hospitals and kindergartens, and it will throw immigrants and their children out on the street so that Greeks can take their place. I think we can say that whatever our problems, we would not exchange them for those of our neighbours right now. The task of those of us who study integration is to wrestle with the everyday reality of what the philosopher Sir Isaiah Berlin uh, predicted many years ago, that restless humanity would one day have to find new ways of living together graciously. I've always liked Berlin's formulation, living together graciously, because the alternative, or one of the alternatives, the word tolerance has incorrectly and sadly come to imply, in English, a grudging coexistence between people who barely know each other and who, frankly, like it that way. The original Elizabethan idea of toleration was a more active proposition, a dynamic convergence of cultures and traditions to create a new kind of Englishness. Today being the date it is, by the way, it's worth recalling that if we worry about the growth of Islamophobia today, it really pales by comparison with the ferocious per persecution of Roman Catholics for several hundred years in this country, the manifestations of which only truly faded in the last century. For the avoidance of doubt, I do not think we want to emulate all the practices of the first Elizabethans. We know about Walsingham's use of torture and the cruelty of the 16th century police state he created. I do care about security, but I think we need to think pretty hard before we reinvent the Elizabethan security state. But even so, I do think that we could well follow some aspects of the Elizabethan template without the thumbscrews. The uh, idea of toleration does provide a guide to what we might be looking for when we talk about integration, a dynamic convergence. I'd like to say what I have in mind when I say the word integration. I'm not a social scientist by training, I'm a chemist, so I do tend to think in terms of processes and numbers. 
I know that I don't think of integration as what the former Home Secretary Roy Jenkins called a flattening process of assimilation. On the other hand, I don't regard a society which simply consists of a series of separate but more or less interlocking communities with different values, attitudes and behaviours as integrated. Instead, uh, I think of integration as a process, this process of dynamic convergence on a single set of basic values, attitudes and behaviours. Remember, this is a two-way street in which everyone is in motion. How do we know it when we see it? Well, I tend to go for something that I can measure. In this case, for me, the perfectly integrated society is one in which an individual's life chances, preferences and behaviours are randomly related to his or her race or religion. A sociologist might say a society in which race and religion carry no explanatory power in predicting outcomes. A common, shallow journalist like me would translate that as meaning simply that when I walk into the room, my skin colour or the shape of my features should give you no clue as to whether I would be a dustman or a doctor or a bus driver. That's a technical definition, and I'll return to what it might mean in practice before I sit down. But of course, we don't live our lives through, in, through equations. I think we need to bear in mind what integration and its opposite mean in everyday sense, common sense for most people. A note about this. I'm not naive. Race and religion do still render us vulnerable to unjustified discrimination. And that is, for many, the major obstacle to integration. But I don't think it's the only cause. The real world challenge now is very different to most people, for most people, to the challenge of the past 50 years, for three reasons. First, we now understand that each of us is a composite of many things, our family history, professions, gender, race, and so on. For much of my lifetime, making your way in society meant suppressing aspects of that complex configuration in order to fit in with prevailing norms. But as our societies become more affluent, more secure, most of us want to live lives that are more in tune with all aspects of our identities. We want everyone to know who and what we are. We want, our bring, want to bring our whole selves to work, and that includes our faith. In essence, well-off societies are enjoying more freedoms, accommodating more public differentiations of identity. It's all out there, both to celebrate and to irritate. Second, individual attitudes are so much more tolerant and so much less president, pre, uh, prejudiced. We are simply less likely to face overt and deliberate acts of individual bigotry. Twenty years ago, more than a quarter of us would express unease about a black or Asian boss or neighbour, usually by saying that we ourselves had no worries, but we thought there might be problems for our fellow workers or other neighbours or relatives who were not so open-minded. Today, you struggle to find one in 10 people admitting to these attitudes. And amongst people under 30, I suspect that the very questions we used in the 1980s would seem incomprehensible. Third, because of technical advances in data gathering and monitoring, we now, now know a great deal more about the systemic effect of belonging to an identity category, a religion, a race, gender, than we used to. And we know that some of the obstacles to integration aren't invented or purely the result of unequal treatment. They are the result of a gap between the way that some of our institutions work, often, and the way that some of our citizens want to live. And neither is necessarily at fault. We know that some differences and some disadvantages are inherent and, generally speaking, inextric inextricably associated with our race and gender and so forth. They're not, as I say, simply systems of une uh, symptoms of unequal treatment. For example, the Ipsos Mori study of GP patient opinion, a sample of over 100,000 individuals in England and Wales, shows that British Muslims corrected for class and geography are 40% less likely to rate their GPs as very good than the average person. Of course, GPs are pretty diverse, but this is clearly a cultural issue, which we don't yet understand. How do we address it? 
Well, we can take some clues from a study by my colleague, uh, Professor Richard Webber, conducted some years ago for Tower Hamlet's Primary Care Trust. Between 2002-2004, use of accident emergency in Tower Hamlets doubled. Local hospitals struggled to meet the government's four-hour waiting target. Analysis of 200,000 attendance records showed that the overusers were disproportionately Bangladeshi. The first assumption was that this was a kind of immigrant problem, older people who didn't really understand the system. But analysis showed that the overusers were a group, were in fact a group with age spikes at 0 to 5 and 20 to 29. In fact, young families with British born parents. Further focus groups showed that when Mohammed or Asma fell off the slide, unlike their classmates, the decision to take the children to A and E was a family decision. And older Bangladeshis in the family believed that the GPs were less professional. They weren't real doctors uh, unless they wore, wore white coats they, and they gave you a battery of intrusive tests. How to solve that? Well, targeted educational campaigns reduced the overuse in target hospitals within a year. In the target hospitals, there was a 6.4% total decline in a year compared to increases of 3.6% and 2.6% in neighbouring hospitals. GP attendance figures went up. And crucially, savings were significant at between 55 and 100 pounds per visit to A&E, and the four-hour waiting target were met. This problem was solved through marketing and campaigning. It was a clear example of the way that integration can be brought about by action. To take another current issue, we know that we urgently need to find ways of addressing diversity in the police. As usual, politicians and activists have reached for the law. The evidence is that we can achieve change faster and with less confrontational methods. Avon and, and Somerset Police, worried about the poor scores of minority candidates in one of their online recruitment tests, asked the Behavioural Insight Unit, the so-called nudge unit at number 10, to help them understand what was going on. Well, the researchers came up with a pretty simple plan. They adjusted the tone of a reminder email that went to all candidates, making it friendlier in tone. This may seem irrelevant, but actually, this no-cost intervention had the effect of increasing the pass rate among ethnic minorities by 50%. 50%. And more importantly, it eliminated the gap in pass rates between whites and non-whites. Perfect integration. I could give you a range of other examples, but time doesn't allow. The essential point is that we're now learning that problems of integration that we thought had to be solved by legal or regulatory means may be better addressed by other uh, approaches. Ultimately, the puzzle here is how we change human behaviour without state or legal compulsion. That is the question that confronts all of us who worry about the real, on-the-ground, everyday practice of integration. And I want to scratch out briefly three areas that I think we should be exploring to address that problem. First, culture and manners. And by the way, this is extremely subtle and difficult. The signals about uh, of integration uh, can be extremely hard to spot, especially in territory where there is no right or wrong. For example, today, what are our social rules about when and whether to wear this, the red poppy? I'm looking around the room. There are few people wearing them in this room. This afternoon, I'm going to be going to Milton Keynes, and I expect the reverse will be true. Nobody here is wrong. Nobody there is wrong. But it's very different. Does it matter? Well, I think it probably does. And we need to understand why and how. And let me be absolutely clear. I'm not saying that I think everybody in this room is doing something wrong by not wearing a poppy. That's not my point at all. My point is... It's different here. Should we be thinking about why and whether we need to change it? Maybe we need to change the practice in Milton Keynes. But the point here is, how do we change people's reflexes? How do we influence the way we behave, speak, and relate to each other? 
Well, historically in this country, we've tended to rely on a class-based set of rules. In the past, they didn't need to be written down or even properly articulated. We just tried very hard to copy the middle classes. For example, for newcomers to participate fully in a society, they do have to know what the rules of the society actually are. Unfortunately, in Britain, we tend to turn those rules into a kind of cryptic crossword puzzle. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was invited to what was described as a small informal supper at a stately home. Very nice. Small actually meant 24 people, not quite my family's definition, and informal meant an invitation on a stiff card with the words at the bottom, no dress code. Well, this is not a problem if you're a bloke. You wear a suit and no tie. For a woman, it's more complicated. Obviously, you don't wear a tiara. But pearls? No pearls. Summer frock? Business suit. Trousers? Skirt. Well, my wife made me ring up some people who had been to this place before, get some steer on the rules. Their guidance was uniformly vague and useless, of course. In the end, she wore an outfit in which she felt comfortable. Of course, being a woman of taste and discernment, she got that right. But the point of the story is it taught me a lesson about our country. When someone says no dress code, what it really means is that if you don't already know what the code is, are you sure you really belong here? In future, I think we may need to take a leaf out of the French book. They go too far on prescription, but at least you know what you're doing. So to give integration any chance at all, we're going to have to be more explicit about our rules of behavior, and that means deciding what those rules are. One place where this will be especially difficult is in relation to the question of what causes offense. There are many people who think we should be more active in policing what people say. There are some who think we should be more sensitive to others' feelings of hurt when we make fun of Jesus or the prophet Muhammad. I disagree. We cannot and should not censor speech. One reason is that this path is always oppressive and usually ends up making the censor look foolish. If we did give in to that temptation, we would be no better than the old Soviet Union or the present China. Offence is a part of the reality of a diverse society. It need not make, make us unequal. So there are issues of cultural manners which can't be dealt with by statute, but which are vital to resolve in an integrated society. I want to turn finally to the hardest nut of all, apparently inherent cultural and ethnic preferences. Remember my mathematical definition of integration, a society in which life chances, outcomes and preferences are random with respect to race and religion. The evidence is emerging that though we may make progress towards reducing the predictability associated with race and religion, we may ne never get anywhere near that definition for real reasons. There are intrinsic differences between identity groups, and this is a sensitive issue which most public figures would prefer to avoid, but which I believe in time uh, we have to solve. Let me give you a couple of examples of why I think we find it hard to discuss these differences, and I'll focus on a topic that matters to everyone, educational success or otherwise. It's clear that in this country, standards of achievement at 16, GCSE level, are rising. For a decade or more, we've monitored the numbers. We learned that girls generally do better than boys. We've learned that different ethnic groups perform differently, but they can improve. For example, African-Caribbean boys who used to trail the pack are catching up. However, the data confront us with one extremely uncomfortable and really consistent finding, which, by the way, is echoed internationally. In most ethnic groups, there is a 20% gap between the performance of the poor and the average student, by which I mean socioeconomically poor. There is only one exception to this rule. Children of Chinese heritage, where the poor, not poor gap is just, in fact, it's slightly less on new results uh, than 2%, and where actually it doesn't matter much because poor Chinese children, 90% of whom get five good GCSEs, beat the pants off every other demographic, irrespective of class. The hard question here is, what do they have that the rest of us don't? And if we can copy it, should we? Or should we just regard it as a kind of un, 
just inequality, which of course should lead to some form of reverse discrimination. Allied to this, let's look at the, the effect of school choice. Today, parents have greater choice over the schools which their children attend in England and Wales than they used to. That's a good thing. But work from British, Bristol University has shown that over the past decade, parents' preferences for schools with more children who are similar to their own in various ways means that most schools are more ethnically segregated than the communities they sit in. Let me emphasize, these people are not bigots. It is not white flight. It applies to minorities too. But it does mean and I'll finish in a moment, that our schools are changing in character. In some cities, most minority children sit in classes where there are hardly any children who do not share their ethnicity. According to the Mapping Integration Project at Demos, my colleague David Goodhart is up next, between 2008 and 2013, there was a 31% increase in the number of ethnic minority children starting school in England. 61% of those minority children began their educations in schools where ethnic minorities are the majority of the student body. And in London, that figure is 90%. Ultimately, we cannot and should not restrict choice. So how do we encourage a shared future? I would say the single most important step right now is simply to begin to have the courage to acknowledge these differences. Something that we fail to do, for example, in London, where all of the evidence tells us that the extraordinary improvement in London schools is down to the performance of uh, high-achieving ethnic minority groups. But uh, government ministers and actually most academics simply refuse to acknowledge or even to investigate this. But frankly, if we were to try to work out whether the success of some group, what, what causes the success of some groups, Bangladeshi girls, for example, we might be able to find ways of dealing with the chronic failure of others, white or Pakistani boys being key demographics for failure. That is the virtue of integration. Okay, well, my time is up. Um, I wish you success with your debates today, tomorrow. The word academic has come to mean, regrettably, abstract and irrelevant to everyday life. Actually, this conference is an example of exactly the opposite, rigorous analysis of an intensely relevant contemporary issue. I might point as an example to the brilliant work carried out by Professor Miles Houston at Oxford, which was reported on the Today programme this morning on contact theory as the sort of thing we need to have at our fingertips as policymakers to work out how to deal with the future that is coming down the road. This is why societies need universities like this one and the work that you do. And I look forward to seeing your outcomes. Thank you. Thank you.